Part 4 is here. The episode I know you have all been waiting for. We're on now to episode 4. And this is the episode by far that I am the most on the fence about. And the reason being, guys, is because originally I was going to have this episode as, you know, Halloween 2018, Halloween Kills, and then Halloween Ends. And then I saw Halloween Ends and (laughs) felt like that thing needed an entire episode to go over everything that was wrong with it. But then I thought about it and I'm like, no, this is a trilogy. This is a series of films that are interconnected regardless of how Halloween Ends turned out. So this whole episode will have Halloween 2018, Halloween Kills, and Halloween Ends. We're going to go over the entire trilogy right here on the final episode of the Halloween series of the podcast. And I'm not going to lie, guys, just like many others in the horror community, I was super excited for Halloween Ends. I was really pumped. I was so jammed. I, uh, you guys know I was, I've been talking about it nonstop on social media and on the podcast about how excited I was to watch this movie. And in my opinion, it was just a complete and utter letdown. But if you liked it, that's okay too. I want to make it very clear at the beginning of this episode, I will not be bashing people or people's opinions if they liked Halloween Ends. We're literally just going to go over what, in my opinion, are the issues and problems with Halloween Ends. But I'm also going to be touching on the things they did right. Like, there were still great moments in Halloween Ends. There were. While they may not have been as impactful as we wanted them to be, at the end of the day, there was still good moments to be had. And I'll be talking about that as well. But I want to make it clear That regardless of what your opinion is, whether or not you liked Halloween Ends or if you didn't, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. What matters the most is that you are a Halloween fan and you're not bashing other people for their opinions, guys. So please be respectful and know that if you're listening to this podcast, it doesn't matter if you loved it or if you hated it. We're still friends and you can still enjoy this episode. So let's dive in and let's get started on talking about Halloween 2018, which was a movie that I really wasn't excited for when it was first announced. (laughs) Like, in all fairness, when it hit my radar years ago, I was so concerned. Like, Resurrection was obviously an absolute shit show, and Rob Zombie's Halloween movies did nothing but, like, further push that bullshit lore that was developed in haste for Michael Myers. But like many others in the horror community, I wasn't not going to watch it. Like, for fuck's sakes, it's Michael fucking Myers. At the end of the day, like, I don't care if I'm going in with low expectations. My only expectation was that I get to see Michael Myers. So I'm really glad I went into Halloween 2018 with low expectations, because, like, I came out blown to smithereens. (laughs) It was so good. Like, this movie is incredible. Both the 2018 requel and Halloween Kills are absolutely incredible slasher films, hands down. Like, they finally threw out the lore that we hated for decades, and they gave us what Michael truly is at his core, which is the epitome of sheer evil, which I know is a big topic for Halloween ends. When John Carpenter first graced us with Halloween in 1978, never was it the expectation that it would turn into the powerhouse horror franchise that it is today, right? Like, we're over 40 years in. We've got over 10 entries in the franchise. Of course, there was a number of films over the years that changed hands between directors, visionaries. So because of this, the timeline of Michael Myers' lore can be a little bit messy. This is where Halloween 2018 came in to truly save the day of the timeline. So Halloween 2018, it's set 40 years after the events of the 1978 film, which effectively retconned every single Halloween film that came after the first one. Halloween 2018 was so good that it became the highest grossing slasher movie in the history of film, beating out the title holder at the time, Scream, the first Scream movie. The great thing about this film was how it stood itself apart from every film before it. No matter which film you watched in the Halloween franchise, Halloween 2 was always considered canon in that timeline. Whether it be the Curse of the Thorn trilogy, whether it be H2O, even though H2O may have retconned Halloween 4-6, to the sequel was still present, especially the, the specific aspect of lore that Michael Myers and Laurie Strode were actually siblings, which of course, a big bone of contention for many horror fans. Some people dig that concept, some people didn't right? It just depends on what you want to get out of the franchise. The only real similarity between Halloween 2 and Halloween 2018 is that Michael does end up coming after Laurie Strode. Although in Halloween 2018, they make it very clear 
that the two, Michael Myers and Laurie Strode, are not siblings. The motivation for Michael, it feels a lot more like he's focusing on the one that got away, like an act of revenge for his years of imprisonment up in Smith's Grove. This is what makes for a much more terrifying experience, right? Because if the two of them are related, Laurie becomes part of his legend, and it removes a lot of that foundation which was developed in the first Halloween film. This makes it so that it ends up just being a random encounter all along. Right? Like, there was no reason for him to go after Laurie Strode. It was just a random encounter all along, which could really happen to anybody. So that is an aspect that makes it more terrifying. And it really puts the audience in that role. Because now the audience is sitting there thinking, oh man, well, the boogeyman can come at me at any time. It's not like I have he has to be my brother or <laughs> I have to be related to the boogeyman for him to come after me. So by taking away that aspect of lore, you've now made Michael Myers a much more terrifying boogeyman. And we know that the world of Michael Myers, it went through a lot between Halloween Resurrection and Halloween 2018, including two terrible Rob Zombie movies. There were also tons of half-cocked ideas on where to take the franchise. Thankfully, though, none of them came to fruition. It wasn't until 2016 when Bloomhouse and Miramax announced a team-up that would end up giving us something concrete on a new Halloween movie. It was actually Halloween which created the milestone for Bloomhouse Productions to start making horror movies. And we all know the impact that Bloomhouse has had on the horror genre. It's awesome to know that it was Halloween that actually pretty much gave us the rest of the Bloomhouse horror movies that we have today. One of them being Black Phone, so keep that in mind. Black Phone was pretty good. In my humble opinion though, what really made this requel of Halloween so incredible was the addition of John Carpenter. He came on as an executive producer for the film in 2016. Then on February 9th, 2017, both David Gordon Green and Danny McBride were announced as the writers behind the project. David Gordon Green would be the director, while Carpenter would be advising on the project. And Carpenter had said in previous interviews that he was actually really impressed by the pitch that was presented to him from the writers. He truly felt like that they get it and they know where to take the franchise from here. So instead of rebooting the franchise again, like many of the attempts before it, they chose initially to focus on continuing the mythology from the first two films while they were developing the story for Halloween 2018. When they ended up pitching the idea specifically to Carpenter, the story began to be fleshed out so that all of the sequels were ignored in this new continuity of the film. Being that the writers themselves were self-proclaimed fans of the first Halloween movie, there was no major steps taken in production without the approval of John Carpenter. They knew right off the bat that in order to make this a successful series of films, and a series of films nonetheless that truly stand the test of time, they had to have the original visionary on board. Especially considering how displeased Carpenter was with the reimagining of Halloween with Rob Zombie. He was not a fan of that, so you know you want to get that seal of approval, right, from the man himself. What's interesting in Halloween 2018 is that Laurie Strode has a daughter who's alive and is not Jamie Lloyd early drafts of this script, they had actually called for the character to come back and be alongside her mother in the film. However, rewrites ended up changing the daughter to Karen, despite the fact that Danielle Harris, who was the original actress that played Jamie Lloyd, pleaded with the directors to include her into the film, and felt very strongly about Lori having a daughter that was not Jamie Lloyd. And in total, the writers had put together 80 drafts of the script over a period of eight months, and despite this, they still continued to do rewrites all the way up until the last week of filming. And in what was probably a super stressful situation for the writers, when they were putting the script together, they weren't sure at the time whether or not they were going to be able to get Jamie Lee Curtis to come back in the iconic role of Laurie Strode. It wasn't until 2017 that we received word from the final girl queen herself that she would be facing Michael Myers once again in Halloween 2018. That's when horror fans everywhere began to flip out. Because not only were we going to get the original iconic Laurie Strode in her role, we were getting John Carpenter back. Then horror fans everywhere began to flip out. Because on December 20th, 2017, another original cast member was announced to be returning, which is Nick Castle, the same man who donned the mask in Halloween 1978. It was announced that he'd be putting the mask on once again for the movie, alongside James Jude Courtney. Both Obviously, absolutely iconic people to wear the mask, Nick Castle being the first ever. And when James Jude Courtney first came on board, Green had explained to him the vision 
that he had for how Michael should act, and it was meant to be an amalgamation of the original performance that Nick Castle had played in Halloween 1978, along with a cat-like style of movement thrown into the mix. So Courtney utilized much of the work that John Carpenter and Nick Castle did on the original film to truly determine how the 40-year time gap would impact Michael Myers as a character which really goes to show the depths that an actor is willing to go to really encapsulate the role. And I feel like that's why a lot of people connected more to Michael Myers with this trilogy of films than any other film before it. Because I truly feel that James Jude Courtney added a very human element to Michael. And not just in the way that he was portrayed on screen, but the way he acted, the way he moved. Like, yeah, there was some sort of feline kind of tendency in the way he slithered, in a sense, I guess you can say, if you really dive deep into it. But the biggest part of it all was that they've made him a human. They've really pushed the fact that he's just a man in a mask. And the portrayal of Courtney as Michael Myers really pushed that fact all the way to the beginning here in Halloween 2018. And principal production of the movie was initially scheduled for late October of 2017 in Charleston, South Carolina. However, it ended up getting delayed until January 13th, 2018. Danny McBride really wanted the film to create a sense of tension and dread for the audience, which obviously was something that Carpenter was very good at executing in the original 1978 Halloween film. The reliance on atmosphere and tension without the need for an exorbitant amount of graphic violence, it can truly be seen throughout the 2018 Halloween movie. The mask that they used in the film, it was a life cast of Courtney's face, which was weathered and aged to reflect that authentic evolution of the character since the original. This is a detail, though, that, that I'm a huge fan of. When we, when we see Michael at the beginning of Halloween 2018 and we see his mask, it's weathered. It's been 40 years, right? So there's no way it could be that same crisp white that it was on that Halloween night. There's no doubt that it's going to be different. It's going to be battered. It's going to be torn, bruised. So the fact that they went that extra step and made that attention to detail, it really made all the difference to me, right? Showing where the evolution of the character and how it progressed. And Courtney himself was involved in every scene that featured Michael Myers. Nick Castle was involved only for a minimal amount of filming, pretty much just a cameo appearance. He's in the scene with Jamie Lee Curtis, where his reflection is seen in the window, though he also did all the breathing sounds for Michael in post-production as well. The movie then went on to make its world premiere, the Toronto International Film Festival, on September 8th, 2018. It was then theatrically released on October 19th, 2018. It grossed a total of $159.3 million between the U.S. and Canada, with an additional $96.3 million coming in from the rest of the world. So the total worldwide gross for Halloween 2018 was $255.6 million. That is insane. That is freaking awesome. It's a phenomenal film and truly a testament to the character Michael Myers. So let's dive right into the plot of Halloween 2018 and find out what's in store for Lori and Michael now. Halloween 2018 kicks us off on October 29th, and we learn that Michael Myers has been institutionalized at Smith's Grove Psychiatric Hospital for 40 years. He's now scheduled to be transferred to a maximum security prison after his doctors have deemed him to be completely unfixable. Then a couple of true crime podcasters show up, and they decide they're going to be the ones who get the story on Michael Myers. Their names are Aaron and Dana, and they visit the hospital where Michael Myers is currently being held. When they're brought to where Michael is, Aaron has Michael's mask. And he lifts it up, and I think he was about probably 40, 50 feet away from him, and everybody in the place just started losing their minds, but Michael didn't move. He didn't say a word. He made no response when Aaron showed the mask to him. So the next day, Michael ends up being transferred, and of course, in typical Halloween Michael Myers fashion, the bus crashes and the patients escape. There's a father and son who end up driving by, and they're on the same road as the crash, unfortunately, so they stop to be good Samaritans and see if they can help out. Of course, they end up getting murdered by Michael, who takes their truck and heads towards Haddonfield. This is where we get to see how Lori Strode has been handling the decades since her last encounter with Michael Myers in Haddonfield. Unfortunately, she's not doing too good. She lives in fear of Michael and has ever since the events that took place 40 years prior. She's a heavy drinker, rarely leaves her house, which is also heavily fortified, by the way. And she also has a daughter named Karen, who she has a completely strained relationship, 
because of her trauma from that night. On top of that, there's also a granddaughter named Allison who she tries to maintain a really close relationship with. So on the morning of Halloween, Michael ends up running into the true crime podcasters again, the same ones who tried to fuck with him at Smith's Grove. And the worst part of all is, is that he runs into them while visiting his sister Judith's grave. So he decides he's going to follow them to a gas station, brutally murder both of them and a mechanic, then steal the getup of the mechanic, head over to Aaron's car, open up the trunk, and pull out the mask. In what is, I'm sure, a scene everyone has seen, everyone can agree it's an iconic Michael Myers scene. He just pulls the mask up right in between, and he pulls the, he pushes the trunk, trunk down, and you just see that glimpse of him in that mask. Terrifying. The blackest eyes in that scene. Love it. So back in Haddonfield, we've got Deputy Frank Hawkins. He's caught wind of Michael's escape, and he was also the arresting officer back in 1978. So obviously he knows the threat that Michael Myers is, so he tries to convince Sheriff Barker that there's a real danger here with Michael on the loose. News of the escape also reaches Lori, who of course goes into a flurry of panic, and she tries to warn her family of the incoming onslaught that she knows is going to happen with Michael Myers. Though because of the fact that she spent so many decades trying to protect them from someone who never actually came, her concerns are end up just being thrown to the wayside. No one believes her. Allison ends up meeting up with her boyfriend Cameron, finds out that he's cheating on her while her best friend Vicky is babysitting with her boyfriend Dave. Yeah, I know, a little bit of a love relationship here, but don't worry, it won't get that bad until ends. The two <laughs> end up uh, being killed by Michael, and then the police get called. So Deputy Hawkins and Lori end up hearing the call over a police radio, so of course they immediately head over to the house. This is where, for the first time in 40 years, we get Lori Strode and Michael Myers. She shoots him in the shoulder before he flees off and the police end up taking Lori Karen and her husband Ray back to Lori's house to keep them protected. And during the scenes in the early part of the movie where the podcasters were attempting to interview Michael Myers, we were introduced to Michael's psychiatrist, Dr. Ranbir Sartain. He was actually a former student of Dr. Sam Loomis, who of course was the doctor that was watching over Michael in the original Halloween movies. And when Michael escaped, he immediately wanted to make his way to Haddonfield so he could try and help with the hunt for Michael. And during this time where Michael's running around Haddonfield on his killing spree, Allison has no idea what's going on around town. <laughs> so she's actually walking home from a party with her friend Oscar. He ends up dying in a pretty sweet kill suite sequence, might I add. I, I actually really enjoyed the way that they, they had him in like this backyard and the light would shut off and then Michael would move closer towards him and the light would just come right back on. Like, I, I really liked how that kill sequence played out. It was pretty dope. And before Michael can end up killing Allison, Hawkins and Sartain arrive just in time to save her. Hawkins tries to kill Michael, but Dr. Sartain steps in, and he ends up attacking Hawkins. This is where we learn that he's become obsessed with Michael and was the sole cause of Michael's escape as he orchestrated the whole thing just so he could study Michael in the wild. And I actually, now that I've seen ends and now that we're reviewing this all together, I think this scene right here was actually the beginning of the undertone that became the tone of Halloween ends. Because this is kind of where we first see the evil that Michael is impact other people around him. And that was really the big kind of plot point I think we can all agree on when it comes to Halloween ends. So Dr. Sartain ends up kidnapping Michael and Allison and locks them in the backseat of his car as they head towards Lori's house. Of course, in true Michael Myers fashion, he ends up waking up in the backseat and he kills Sartain, which leaves Allison available to run like hell and get the heck out of Dodge. So she ends up at the house where Lori and the rest of the family is, and then of course Michael shows up. He strangles Ray as soon as he gets into the house, and Lori gets Karen to safety before she starts her epic showdown with Michael. Lori ends up injuring Michael by shooting off some of his fingers, and then he stabs her in the abdomen and pushes her off the balcony. He walks over to check on her body, and then we get a scene that's so reminiscent of the first Halloween. Lori's body's not there. Just like when Loomis went to go look for Michael Myers' body at the end of Halloween 1978, his wasn't there. So that was a good little callback and kind of flipped the script on Mikey. I liked it. So Karen breaks down in tears after realizing that her mother's probably dead. She ends up calling out for her mother, and then Michael goes towards her. Well, this was actually just a trap to lure Michael towards her so that she could shoot him in the jaw. Lori ends up making a triumphant comeback and attacks Michael, trapping him inside a safe room she created, along with Karen and Allison's help. 
They end up setting the house on fire, and Rory says her goodbyes to Michael before she faints and gets taken to the hospital. And that wraps us up for the movie. Now, if you stick around for the post-credits of the film, you'll hear breathing at the end, which indicates, of course, Michael is not quite done yet. No surprise, though, because obviously we've got two more movies to go over on this episode. Halloween 2018, it really took the elements of the story that fans liked and put a spotlight on them. At the same time, they effectively removed so much from canon that fans and Carpenter himself just obviously we weren't very fond of. This is what gave Halloween fans the continuity that we always wanted, right? Like, now we get to watch the story of Michael and Lori unfold properly. Well, we thought we were going to. It's my opinion that it did not unfold properly, but it did unfold. <laughs> we're going to talk about that soon. It's definitely going to be interesting to uh, see how Halloween ends in this trilogy in general stands the test of time and how this will this canon that they've created is going to impact future Halloween movies. But until that time, we've still got Halloween Kills to talk about, which is a direct sequel to Halloween 2018, and it kickstarts right from the events of the Halloween 2018 film, similar, funny enough, to how Halloween 2 kickstarted right from the, the, uh, the ending of Halloween 1978. So they kept the similarities between the sequels, despite the fact that the original sequel's retcon now. And a lot of people, for some reason, they've spoken out saying that this movie, Halloween Kills, is what ended up killing the trilogy. And I've heard people say that's also one of the worst Halloween movies ever created. Now, I, of course, everyone is entitled to their opinion, but that's definitely not mine. Like, my opinion is short and sweet when it comes to Halloween Kills. It is the best Halloween movie since 1978. That is my humble opinion, 100%. I consider it to be the best modern retelling of Michael Myers that has ever been produced. And it was really done so in a way that gave us a Michael Myers who is literally evil. Like, he's nothing but the presence of evil in this movie. There's no rhyme or reason to what he does. He just senselessly kills everyone in his path. The original plan for Halloween 2018 and Halloween Kills was to be shot back to back. However, McBride and Green decided against it because they wanted to see how people were first going to react to Halloween 2018. And once the film hit opening weekend, obviously it made huge bank, and there was no doubt at that point that a sequel was going to be coming out. So reports started coming out in June of 2019 that the sequel was going to start filming in September of 2019. And it was reported at the time that the studio was considering filming two sequels back to back, and then releasing both of them for October 2020. However, the official word... However, we later learned that Halloween Kills was going to be released on October 16th, 2020, and then Halloween Kills on October 15th, 2021. Of course, just like everything else in the world, the COVID-19 pandemic totally threw those release schedules off, and we literally just got Halloween Kills. <laughs> and also in July of 2019, it was confirmed that Nick Castle was going to return again for this sequel and the sequel after it, alongside James Jude Courtney. They were also bringing back an original character, Tommy Doyle, in Halloween Kills. So they casted Anthony Michael Hall in the role of Tommy Doyle. And they had actually also reached out to Paul Rudd, by the way. I'm not sure if you guys know that. Paul Rudd was the original actor who played Tommy Doyle in Halloween 5, The Curse of Michael Myers, I believe it was, or was it Halloween 6? Pretty sure it was 6 now. Anyways, now I look stupid. So whichever Halloween movie he was in, he had played Tommy Doyle. However, Paul Rudd was committed to filming Ghostbusters Afterlife at the time, so he was unavailable, which I'm completely cool with because I feel like considering the kind of Hollywood star Paul Rudd is now, like considering he's Ant-Man, you know, he's in the MCU, everyone knows him. I, I feel like adding Paul Rudd to Halloween Kills would have had too much celebrity star power in it that would have taken away from the film itself. Too many people, I feel, would have been focused on Paul Rudd and not the movie. So I'm glad that that casting didn't end up going through. And also because I really enjoyed Anthony Michael Hall's portrayal of Tommy Doyle, I really feel like he kicked ass. He did, he did a good job in that role. And we also learned in the same month that Halloween Kills and Halloween Ends were going to be filmed in Wilmington, North Carolina at the exact same time. Filming ended up starting on September 16th, 2019, and then concluded on November 3rd, 2019. And of course, with the COVID-19 pandemic and everything, the movie wasn't able to premiere until September 8th, 2021, when it premiered at the 78th Venice International Film Festival. And then it was theatrically released on October 16th, 2021. Halloween Kills then went on to gross $94 million in the US and Canada, with $39.6 million coming from the rest of the world. 
This brought a total worldwide gross for the movie to $131.6 million. And while it may not have been as wildly successful as Halloween 2018 was, it still remains to me one of the best portrayals of Michael Myers on film. Hands down. And it's still made over $100 million for a horror movie. That's pretty bank. So let's chat about the plot of Halloween Kills, and hopefully you'll understand why I enjoy this movie so much. So we go back to the beginning of the series on October 31st, 1978. That is where this movie starts. We see Deputy Frank Hawkins, who accidentally shoots his partner dead while trying to save him from Michael Myers. Michael ends up also being pretty much on execution by Samuel Loomis, and Deputy Frank Hawkins also steps in the way and prevents Loomis from executing Michael. So we learn this information about Hawkins. It's going to play part in the movie plot later on, so keep that in mind. Fast forward 40 years later to where we are now, October 31st, 2018. We see Deputy Frank Hawkins, who was stabbed and left to die by Dr. Sartain in the last film. Hawkins is actually found by Cameron, and Hawkins is still alive. So Cameron calls an ambulance and ends up getting Hawkins to the hospital, where we find out that Hawkins has a regret for not allowing Michael's execution, and then he vows that he's going to be the one who brings him down. Meanwhile in town, we get to meet Tommy Doyle. Tommy Doyle's back, and he's not alone. He's with a whole bunch of other survivors from previous Halloween movies. We see Marion Chambers, Lindsay Wallace, and Cameron's father, Lonnie Elam. They're all having a 40th anniversary celebration of Michael's imprisonment. We then get to see what's going on with Lori and her house, because remember, the house caught flames. Her house is on fire. <laughs> so obviously, there's firefighters that are going to be responding to Lori Strode's burning down house. Inadvertently, of course, they end up releasing Michael. So Michael slaughters all of them with their own equipment. Lori, her daughter Karen, and her granddaughter Allison, they're all over at Haddonfield Memorial Hospital where Lori's undergoing emergency surgery. Michael ends up getting out of the house and fighting through all the firefighters, heads over to Lori's neighbor's house, and makes his way back through the rest of Haddonfield. Word of Michael's killing spree ends up hitting the radar of Tommy, Marion, and Lindsay and Lonnie, and they learn of Michael's killing spree through a wireless emergency alert. Karen then finds out that Michael's still alive, and she decides she's going to withhold that information from Lori to allow her some time to recover. Allison at the same time reconciles with her boyfriend Cameron, and they both join Tommy's mob to help avenge her own father's death. Lori and Hawkins, they're both in the same hospital room together now. They awaken and begin to reminisce about their former relationship. And then we get to see the survivors who have banded together in this town mob. They start warning the Haddonfield community to stay inside their houses. Marion, Vanessa, and her husband Marcus, they unfortunately end up getting killed by Michael. Lindsay escapes, and she gets found by Tommy, Lonnie, Allison, and Cameron. So the group end up mapping out Michael's path. They want to see where he's going so that they can get there first, right? And when they map his path based on the victim's locations, they deduce that he's heading towards his childhood home. So Tommy takes Lindsay to the hospital and reunites with former Haddonfield Sheriff Lee Brackett, whose daughter was Annie and killed in the 1978 Halloween film. And they all inform Lori about Michael's survival. As Lori prepares to leave the hospital, across town Michael murders the current owners of his home and takes it for his. <laughs> He's like, get the fuck out of my house. And then we learn a little bit about Lance Tavoli. He's a fugitive convict from Smith's Grove Psychiatric Hospital and the driver of Vanessa's car from earlier in the film. He had escaped alongside Michael when their bus crashed, so he ends up arriving at the hospital and gets mistaken for Michael Myers, because of course no one's seen Michael's real face. So really, they're just expecting to see someone scary that would be their envisioning of fear, right? but you don't know for sure if that's Michael. Yet, they just decided he was and decided to go for him. The mob end up pursuing him through the hospital, and then Karen realizes that he, he's not Michael. She tries to calm the mob down and help Lance out, but he ends up jumping out the window to his death. At this point, Lori's urging Karen to just work with Tommy and Brackett to hunt Michael down themselves. Elsewhere, Lonnie enters Michael's home and gets killed, because... Why the fuck would you enter Michael's childhood home, let alone alone, and expect to walk out alive? That's just ignorance. That, but that's my opinion. Allison and Cameron then end up rushing inside and find, of course, Lonnie's corpse, and then, of course, get attacked by Michael, who ends up murdering Cameron. So Michael then ends up going after Allison to kill her, but Karen stabs him in the back with a pitchfork, steals his mask, and then starts to taunt him to follow her outside. She leads Michael right into Tommy's mob, they swarm him, they attack him, and seemingly, it looks like they end up killing him. 
So the mob ends up dispersing. Everyone's, you know, licking their wounds in a sense. But, of course, Michael recovers and ends up massacring the entire mob, including Tommy and Brackett. And then back at Michael's childhood home, we see Karen going upstairs to investigate while Allison's receiving medical attention. Michael appears behind Karen and stabs her to death in Judith Meyer's old bedroom as Lori stares out of her hospital room. That is the ending of Halloween Kills. It ended suspensefully. It ended in a way that really made you want to know what, where it was going from here and also how they were actually going to stop Michael once and for all. And I feel like a lot of the expectations is what, what caused a lot of the hate for Halloween Kills, but I don't feel like they were unrealistic expectations. Based on everything I've said to you right now, if you've never seen these movies, you would be going into Halloween Ends expecting a slasher film. You'd be expecting a film of sheer carnage, especially after Halloween Kills. You want to see Michael and Laurie finally end off, which they do. I'll admit they do. But I'm telling you right now what you are, what you expect and what you should expect based on the first two movies are not what you're going to get here with Halloween Ends, which is what we're going to dive right into. Now is the time. The time you've all been waiting for is for me to talk about Halloween Ends in serious depth. Now, Green set out to make each sequel in this trilogy different, and he certainly accomplished that. For the uh, second film, he wanted an action film, and I feel like it was definitely action-paced, obviously. And for the finale, which is what we're going over soon here, Halloween Ends, he wanted a love story, which he certainly got. In October 2021, Green revealed that Halloween Ends was going to take place four years after the events of Halloween Kills, and it was going to incorporate elements of the pandemic into the story. Although I didn't really see any elements of the pandemic in the movie whatsoever, to be honest with you. If I missed it, guys, let me know. But I saw no elements of the pandemic written into this. And Jamie Lee Curtis has claimed that the film was going to be shocking, and I even heard her say that it was going to make people very angry, and she was right, obviously. <laughs> it's, it's caused a serious divide in the horror community. People are pissed about Halloween Ends. I'm one of them. I'm, I'm pissed about Halloween Ends. I do feel borderline insulted as a Halloween fan who's watched this since I was a kid. I've, I'm, I am borderline insulted by it, but that's just my opinion. That is my feelings. You don't have to feel the same way, and I want to make that very clear. And according to Green, there was several different endings that were considered for the film, and they actually even changed the ending once again uh, when test screenings had happened months before the release. Green ultimately chose to have a more optimistic and hopeful conclusion after the bleak ending that we got in Halloween Kills. And as we know, it was originally planned to film Halloween Kills and Halloween Ends back-to-back, -back, but it didn't occur to the intense schedule and, of course, everything with the pandemic getting in the way. So March 2020, Bloom confirmed that they were going to start filming in the summertime of that year. Filming was quietly delayed, though, because, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. And then production was expected to start again in Wilmington, North Carolina in 2021. It wasn't until January 10th, 2022, that Jude Courtney confirmed that they actually had started filming. However, it wasn't until January 19th, 2022, that filming officially began in Savannah, Georgia, and it was under the working title of Cave Dweller, which, as I go through and talk about this movie, it doesn't surprise me in the least that uh, the working title of this movie was Cave Dweller. Michael Simmons, he once again served as director of photography, and Jamie Lee Curtis began filming her scenes on January 25th and wrapped up filming for her on February 22nd. Additional scenes were shot in Sylvania, Georgia, and filming concluded on March 9th, 2022, although there were two weeks of reshoots that were reported to take place in Savannah in June of 2022, but they only lasted four days and they were completed in the same month. Bloom confirmed in June 2022 that the film had test screened internally the month prior, and it would be the last Halloween film that would be produced from Bloom House. That same month, we also got confirmation that Castle was going to appear in the film in a small role, which is an awesome cameo appearance, by the way. When I was watching Halloween Ends and I saw Nick Castle pop up, I pointed at the, at the freaking, uh, I pointed at my screen like I was Leonardo DiCaprio in that meme, and I'm like, oh, it's Nick Castle! <laughs> that was a totally exciting moment for me. I loved that. And we also got word from Carpenter the following month that the film was going to be a departure from previous entries in Green's trilogy. And we really should have taken that as a warning and really taken that to heart. <laughs> After several test screenings of the movie, the original final showdown between Laurie Strode and Michael Myers, as well as the ending sequence, was completely discarded. And they did reshoots for new scenes that took place in August 2022, which was only two months before the film was set to premiere. And it was decided that the conclusion of the film should be more modest and intimate instead of being super noisy and aggressive like the end of Kills. Green just wanted to return the series to its simple dramatic roots. So he, 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 he did that. 
He definitely did that. Halloween Ends premiered first at Grauman's Chinese Theatre in Los Angeles as part of Beyond Fest on October 11th, 2022. This premiere coincided with actually Jamie Lee Curtis's induction ceremony at the Hollywood Walk of Fame in front of the theater the following day, which is awesome. I'm so glad to see that Jamie Lee Curtis got inducted into the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Gosh, she is the epitome of final girl. She's a class act at the same time. And guys, no matter how much I bash this movie and I hate this movie, I want to make one thing clear. Jamie Lee Curtis carried this movie. She was incredible. Every single scene she had, every moment she owned it. And she held this movie like i have nothing but good things to say about jamie lee curtis and how she played this movie halloween ends was then released theatrically in the united states on october 14th 2022 in addition it also streamed simultaneously on peacock which it would do for 60 days following release and as of october 18th the box office for halloween ends so far it's 43.9 million dollars for the u.s and canada and then $17.2 million from everywhere else on the globe. So I guess you can say for opening weekend, they made $61.1 million worldwide, which, you know, it's not terrible, I guess, right? It was projected to gross 50 to $60 million in its opening weekend, so, so I guess they hit the mark, right? The film made $20.2 million on its first day, including $5.4 million from Thursday Night Previews, which was actually up 11% from Halloween Kills, which only made $4.85 million the year prior. And of course, many people liked this movie. Many people didn't like this movie. It was an all-out war on the weekend this came out, right, guys? Like, I don't know if you guys were on social media or how involved you were in, but it became a war. It doesn't matter if you liked Halloween Ends. It doesn't matter if you hated it. It doesn't make you any more or any less of a Michael Myers or Halloween fan. We all like what we like. We all like different entries in the franchise, right? Like, I'm sure some of you enjoyed Halloween Resurrection. I'm sure maybe even some of you enjoyed The Revenge of Michael Myers. I didn't. <laughs> and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You can like what you like, and you can hate what you hate. But the moment you start telling other people that they're not a real fan, or they're less than of you because of, of what they believe and what they feel, you're part of the problem. So if that's you, please stop. So now the moment has come. The time is here. We are going to dive in. I've gone scene by scene, and I've documented... The entire movie, I've written the plot out. I'm going to go over exactly what happens in the movie, so there will absolutely be spoilers in this. And I'm also going to break in and say exactly what problems I have with the movie and the things that I felt it did right. Because I feel like there needs to be an honest, logical opinion as to why this movie's bad. Because you can't, a lot of people are just leaning on the fact that, oh, Michael Myers died, so that's why you're mad about it. No, that's not why we're mad about it. There's so many reasons why we're mad about how Halloween ends turned out. And I really hope I get it across to you guys in this episode. So the film opens up with a radio talk show DJ and spooky, upbeat music, which already right there, right? You know that that's setting a tone for a film that's going to be different from previous entries in the franchise. And it's currently Halloween night. And we first meet Corey Cunningham, who is a teenage babysitter babysitting a child in Haddonfield. The parents, they're heading out for what seems to be a Halloween party, so Corey decides he's going to hang out with the kid and watch a scary movie. An argument erupts between the two, and the kid ends up wanting to play hide-and-seek when Corey, of course, tells him no, so fight breaks out. Corey storms off. He heads to the fridge. And this is where I want to comment where we kind of first see, where we see the first horror movie trope getting turned on its head. Because most of the time in horror movies, we know... That someone's going to get killed the moment they go to grab a beer or some sort of alcoholic beverage, right? Like if they're drinking and they're babysitting, you know they're not in for a good time, <laughs> right? That's, that's, that's just the thing. Corey, when he opens the fridge, he first goes to pick up a beer from the fridge, which of course symbolizes he may be Michael's first victim. But then, and I, I actually quite like this, they switched it up. Corey actually ends up grabbing milk. And horror fans, you may know the symbolism behind this, because generally horror movie villains are the ones who drink milk. Like this trope, it goes all the way back to Kubrick's classic A Clockwork Orange. So I really enjoyed how they took this trope, and they kind of went sideways with it. That intrigued me. So I was interested at this point when I first watched the movie. So then Corey hears a noise coming from the living room, where he had left the child originally to go get some milk. And uh, when he comes back, the place looks like a struggle's happened. It's messy, a lamp is knocked over, and the kid is nowhere to be found. Corey also finds that the front door is wide open, so he ends up going on a hunt around the house trying to find the kid. He looks in all the rooms, and he ends up hearing a noise coming from the kitchen. So he heads in, but he finds that the kitchen knife that he was using is missing from the table. So at this point, I was anticipating Michael to show up. 
because y you have a kitchen knife that was stabbed into the table and then it's disappeared. That's like Michael's signature move. And they, they literally drop the T's like right there, but he doesn't even make an appearance yet. So I was kind of, kind of miffed about that. Noises end up coming from upstairs. So Corey heads up and he's going to investigate, hoping to finally, of course, you know, find the kid in this intense game of hide and seek. And as Corey's heading upstairs, he finds the missing kitchen knife laying on top of a stair and he picks it up. This was his first mistake. So then he heads into one of the rooms upstairs and the door randomly just shuts on him. He tries to open the door and he can hear the kid on the other side taunting him. So the kid, you know, shuts the door on him and he's playing a game with him. The parents end up coming home and they hear screams coming from Corey saying, I'm going to kill you, kid. I'm going to kill you, kid. You know, like obvious angry screams from a teenager who just got duped by a kid, right? Like at the end of the day, Corey, he kicks the door to get it open and it hits the kid in the head and sends him flying over a banister with his body landing right in front of his parents as they enter the home. Corey's seen upstairs holding the kitchen knife he'd found while his parents scream over the death of their child. So that is our first introduction to Corey Cunningham, the character who I'm going to warn you guys is the main character of this fucking movie. I kid you not. Not even kidding. Not even a little bit. So then we get the title sequence, which for me has always been an iconic moment in every Halloween movie, and I think many of you can agree. This one had great Easter eggs in it. It is definitely reminiscent of the title sequence for Halloween Season of the Witch, so I would say another attempt for sure by Green to make it very clear early on in the film that this is going to be a much different Halloween movie than any other we've ever seen. The iconic pumpkin in this title sequence is also seen to go through various transformations, almost like another piece of symbolism that this movie was going to be what kickstarts a new era for the Halloween franchise, which, in my opinion, shouldn't be the focus when you're concluding a trilogy. <laughs> Hashtag Star Wars. <laughs> so we then see flashbacks from the original Halloween 1978 movie with a narrative from Laurie Strode, which I assume was to keep fans entertained and sure, you know, make sure that they were going to get their final showdown between Michael and Laurie. It's been many years now since the end of Halloween Kills, and Laurie's living with Allison, her granddaughter. It appears the two have moved on, like in a sense, you know, from the events that happened in Halloween Kills, and there's not even any real mention or closure when it comes to the death of Laurie's daughter at the end of Halloween Kills. Like, I feel the lack of acknowledgement to this right off the bat, it completely takes away from the impact of her death. Like, the impact it would have had on Laurie and Allison. Like, it's now meaningless, because it, it has no actual impact to the story. Like, they only sort of acknowledge it when we get this scene where Laurie gives Allison the wedding rings of her parents, and then there's a brief, like, five-second moment of sadness. And then later in the movie, like, you see a picture of Karen later on, but, like, there's no actual real acknowledgement of the sorrow and the grief that the two of them experienced with, you know, another family member dying at the hands of Michael. So I feel like that death now is has no impact whatsoever. It didn't really impact the story in any way. And through this narration that's being provided by Laurie Strode, we learn that since Michael has vanished, the town of Haddonfield has undergone kind of like an evil spell. The evil that Michael Myers unleashed across the town is now infecting its residents, and it's causing more murders and more chaos to occur in Haddonfield. And once the narration by Laurie is over, we learn that we've actually been listening to excerpts from her book, a book that Laurie Strode's writing about her experience with Michael Myers. Laurie and Allison, they're living their life together in harmony, it seems, having typical conversations that, you know, a grandmother and a granddaughter would have, burning pumpkin pies, like the whole bit. And at the same time, it's also been years since Corey Cunningham murdered that child on Halloween night. We see him again, and he's riding his bike around town. We find out later on that he was basically given a slap on the wrist for his role that night that the child died. Though it's obvious that the death of this child did have some sort of negative impact on the character. After seeing Corey again, we then go back to Allison. She's getting pulled over by her ex-boyfriend, Cop, and it's some attempt to make the character relevant later. Though what's really interesting here is that the camera pans down to a homeless man by the sewers. And then it goes inside to the sewer, giving us a tease that Michael may very well be living here in the sewers underneath Haddonfield. Which, you know, not a bad concept necessarily, but eh, I'm on the fence. So Corey ends up running into a group of bullies when he goes into a convenience store to grab milk, by the way, just saying. He went into a convenience store and bought milk, and these bullies begin to torment him over him killing the child on Halloween night. And despite my hate for this movie, I gotta give the directors a round of applause for the milk part. Like, they did a great job of at least warning us that shit was gonna go south in this film. 
<laughs> like, they, they did a good job there. And during the argument between Cory and the bullies, Cory ends up breaking a glass bottle in his hand out of anger, and Laurie Strode then shows up, saves the day, and disbands the bullies. Laurie brings Cory to the hospital, where Allison is now working as a nurse. And the first time that Allison lays eyes on Cory, we all should have known this movie was going to go to hell. <laughs> because it's love at first sight. You can just see it. She stitches up his hand, and the two of them end up having a conversation outside the hospital. We then pan over to the house, where Allison, Lori, and Lindsay Wallace are talking about how Lori just purposely tried to set Corey up with Allison. Now, quick note that I'd like to say here. We're 25 minutes into the film at this point, and the only kill that we have had was the accidental death of a child, and there's also no sign of Michael Myers. 25 minutes. Also, also, very important, there has been no suspenseful moments outside of minor tension in the beginning scene. So for all of the arguments of, oh, building suspense, building drama, there's none of it so far in 25 minutes. Just want to point that out. And this is not my opinion. This is fact. <laughs> I am literally giving you facts right now. After this scene with uh, Corey and Allison, we learn more about Corey and his home life. And I should have realized at this point that he truly is the main character of the movie. When I first watched it, I still had hope and positivity. I had faith still. I really tried to keep faith. <sighs> but anyways... Corey's mother, she's a toxic, overbearing narcissist who ends up taking out her frustrations on him while his dad cowers in the corner, pretty much. And then we see Allison heading over to the garage where Corey works at so she can bring in her vehicle to get an inspection, a look over, whatever. And he takes this as an opportunity to further push a relationship with Allison and tries to teach her how to ride his moped. And then Allison reveals, well, she didn't actually need anything with her car. She just wanted to see him. So we see the relationship starting to grow, starting to blossom. They're telling us that this isn't going to be what we want it to be. Ay ay ay. Anyways, <laughs> the love, though, it just keeps on giving. And I actually kind of dig this part. So we see Hawkins and Lori. They bump into each other at the grocery store, and they have kind of like this mini awkward encounter because it's, it's pretty much obvious that the two of them are super in love with each other. <laughs> and to be honest, like I said, I've wanted this to come to fruition ever since Halloween Kills. Like that scene where they were in the hospital beds together, I wanted to see the two of them together. I won't lie. I was like, you know what? I can, I can, side, I can dig this. Lori deserves love. <laughs> I'm in for this. I'm not mad about it. What I did find interesting about this scene, though, was the discussion that Lori and Hawkins have about Corey. Because Hawkins says that he's a good kid who caught a tough break. Because Lori mentions to him that she's kind of, you know, taking him under her wing. And I enjoyed this because at this point, I personally, like, I had determined that somehow Corey was going to be the villain in all of this. Mostly because he drank milk. <laughs> Most, mostly because he drank milk, so I had that in my head. So to hear them try to kind of deter the audience that had that same mindset as me, they were trying to deter us in a way that Corey is just misunderstood. And I feel that was very well done because I feel like me myself, at least I won't speak for others, but I connect with Hawkins a little bit and I feel for him. Like I like him as a character. So to hear him turn around and say, you know, Corey just had a bad rap. He just, you know, he, he he's a good kid, but he just, you know, wrong place, wrong time kind of deal. It's like, okay, you know, maybe he isn't misunderstood. Maybe I should just give him a chance. Right. So I felt that was very well done. Lori now leaves the store and she's got a big smile on her face because she just finished talking with Hawkins and they were flirting back and forth. But she's approached by her old neighbor, the one from Halloween Kills, the same one that Michael had brutally attacked and murdered her husband. She immediately starts calling out Lori. She's calling out her positive demeanor, asking her why she's smiling, and then accuses her of instigating Michael and bringing his evil to her and the town of Haddonfield. This scene I really enjoyed as well, because it hit an emotional chord with me, right? Like, I love Lori Strode. <laughs> I don't know if I've gotten that across. She's my ultimate final girl, right? Like, my number one. And I never in a million years would ever look at her as a perpetrator or an instigator in any Halloween movie. Though, to have a perception from Haddonfield residents that Lori has no remorse or even instigated Michael, that's one that actually works. It's a totally logical direction for the town to go in, even though it may not have been one that we wanted, though. Right? Like, I never want to see people turning on Lori Strode. She's the victim here. But in this scene, they portray her as part of the problem. And I thought that was a very interesting take to see that perception play out because we've never seen that before. That was super interesting. So later that night, Corey and Allison, they head out to a Halloween themed party. This is where we get a super awesome cameo from none other than Nick Castle, by the way. And uh, Corey in this Halloween party, he's wearing a clown mask. And it's one that's very reminiscent of the mask that Michael had worn the night that he murdered Judith Myers. 
Allison is wearing a typical Party City cat costume. And the two of them dance the night away, and they take pictures together in the photo booth, you know, seemingly fun time for both of them. That is until Corey heads over to the bar, and he ends up running into the mother of the child that he had murdered. Of course, you know, she, she's calling him out, and the fact that he gets to still live his life and experience things where her son no longer can. So Corey leaves the bar in a rage, right? Like, he's fuming. He blames Allison for bringing him there and opening up all these old wounds. The two of them end up fighting. Corey storms off, and when he makes it over to the bridge, he ends up getting ambushed by that same group of bullies who took him at the convenience store. Things get a little bit out of hand here, and they end up throwing Corey over a bridge, and he lands right outside the sewers. I'm sure you can see where this is going. <laughs> the same sewer, which, you know, was teased to hold Michael Myers, yeah, you can see where this is going. But before we even get a glimpse of the boogeyman, we pan back to Lori and Allison, where they're talking about the fight that Corey and Allison just had. Then we go back to the sewers, and we see Corey. He survived the fall. He's made his way into the sewers. Keep in mind... Now, okay, we are 40 minutes into the film, 40 fucking minutes into a film that people waited 40 years for, and there has been no build of suspense and no sign of Michael Myers, 40 minutes in. Continue. So Corey walks around the sewers, and instead of climbing a ladder and escaping like a normal fucking person would, he decides he's going to start looking through the sewers even more. This is where we finally, like 42, 43 minutes in, finally get to see Michael. We see him as Corey's walking through the sewer, and Michael reaches out his arm through a hole in the wall and grabs Corey's throat. So Corey's struggling to get away, of course. As he's doing this, Michael starts seeing glimpses of the demons that Corey faces every day kind of deal, and they flash before Michael. It almost feels like almost like a montage of evil that Michael connects with, and he lets Corey go. And this is where everything started to go south for me. <laughs> I tried to stay positive, even though I was starting to get worried about the fact that there was zero suspense, zero buildup, and zero Michael. Then we see him for maybe 10 to 15 seconds, and he lets someone live? Michael didn't kill them? That right there is out of character. So Corey ends up making his way safely out of the tunnel. And it's obvious that Michael touching him and freeing him was somehow impacting Corey in a negative way. So he ends up murdering a homeless dude that's outside the sewer that tries to warn him of the evil that Michael Myers is kind of deal. After this whole bullshit moment, <laughs> we see Lori. She's working more on her book. Corey's riding around town on his moped and he's trying to look all gloomy. Lori looks out her window and sees Corey standing behind a bush, similar in a way that we had first seen Michael in Halloween 1978. It was at this moment, guys, I instantly fucking panicked. Because we're now 45 minutes into the movie, we've had maybe 15 seconds of Michael, and now this kid is running around acting like Michael Myers. Like, how, how is that right? Like, I understand if you want to build a new villain, you want to build a new character, you want to talk about this essence of evil, but you don't take the aspects of the character that worked and put it on a new character. That's, that, that just doesn't make sense to me. But wait, there's more. <laughs> so Corey and Allison, they make up. The Lori is now looking at Corey in a much different light. It's as if she notices that some kind of darkness has now randomly taken over Corey. Well, I guess not so random, but like, come on. Allison ends up going off with Corey while Lori looks, you know, deeply concerned. The two of them walk around Haddingfield. Corey ends up admitting to Allison that he killed someone. Now, considering the character arc that Allison has had, you would truly think that this would cause some sort of reaction in Allison. No. Instead, she takes his hand and follows him. Like, this made zero sense to me. She spent her life dealing with her grandmother being traumatized by a murderer. Then she has her mother and father killed by the same murderer. And she just meets this guy. Just meets them. He tells her that he killed someone. And her first instinct isn't to freak the fuck out? Really? She runs into his arms and just embraces the fact that this guy's a murderer? It totally invalidates Allison's journey to this point. Right there. Just poof. Gone. So Corey and Allison head over now to the house where the child had died on Halloween night. That, that same moment that pretty much ruined Corey's life. He relives the event with Allison and walks her through what happened and how he had felt that night. The house is completely abandoned and despite it being years later, still has blood stains in the same spot where the child hit the ground. So I guess it's almost like a, uh, a grave 
for this kid now for some reason. Nice house, though. I'm surprised. Anyways, we then move on to Corey's mom, and she's meeting Lori for the first time. Now, Lori talks to her about Corey and Allison's relationship, and she quickly begins to learn that his mother's a complete bitch. <laughs> like, there's, there's no question there. She even blames Lori for making Corey a monster, because after the incident with Corey, he was now the town boogeyman because Michael was no longer around. So she now blames Lori for this. Lori's getting blamed for that now? Like, the fuck? Corey and Allison are next seen in a bar with Corey trying to convince her that it may be time to leave Haddonfield altogether. During this conversation, we see that ex-boyfriend cop who pulled her over earlier in the movie, he shows up and, you know, tries to lay on the moves. Corey steps in, of course, <laughs> and he attempts to make his presence known, you know, if you catch my drift. Big macho machismo -ness right there. So Allison and Corey head out of the bar, and they ride throughout Haddonfield together on his moped, and he takes Allison home. And Corey now has this gloss of evil in his eyes where he didn't before, you know, ever since his encounter with Michael. So once Corey drops her off, he's followed by the ex-boyfriend cop, who ends up leading to the sewers where Michael's hiding. The ex-boyfriend heads down into the sewers, he's trying to find where Corey went off to, and he finds the body of the homeless man that Corey had previously murdered. He's then attacked from behind by Corey, and a fight between the two ensues. Corey leads him into the sewer drain where Michael's hiding, and he, he basically feeds him to Michael. And this was the scene where I realized they were going to completely go off the rails with this trilogy. And not only that but they were insulting the legacy of Michael Myers. I'm sorry, that's my opinion. I'm going to stand on it. What happens is Michael starts strangling this guy and the two of them start to fight. Corey then comes in and he starts fighting the guy too, like a team up between with Corey and Michael Myers. Now, when Michael was hit and he fell to the ground, Corey starts yelling at him to get up. And it's at this point that we see Michael being portrayed as a weak and frail character. Like he almost winces when Corey's yelling at him to get up. Like, here is where my first real serious issue with the movie comes in, okay? This is my one of my biggest points on why I hate this movie so much. Michael Myers is the boogeyman. Plain and simple. There's no argument there. For over 40 years, he has been the figure that symbolizes evil and murderous chaos. Then in a movie where you showed him for seconds and he didn't even get a kill, you're going to portray him as, as weak like this. Like, how does it add to his legacy? How does this even make sense in any way? There's been no indication whatsoever that Michael is impacted by age or regular human decay. Zero. Then out of nowhere, you're just going to say, wait, never mind, he's human and just a guy in a mask. Yet this whole time, and not just the earlier films, but this trilogy specifically, he was built up as the boogeyman and a force of sheer evil. You can't turn around after that and try to make him human. It tarnishes everything. Everything his legacy had built up until this point, and it removes any chance of being afraid of the boogeyman. Like, I was willing to look past this stupid team-up like I truly was, though you made Michael look weak, and that's not okay. Anyway, so Corey grabs this guy, and he holds him up as Michael limps. Yeah, he fucking limps towards this guy and begins stabbing him violently. This is apparently what gives Michael back his powers. The fact that he killed again, he now has his life force back, so to speak. How is this okay? Like, riddle me this, Batman. He wasn't killing for decades when we first saw him in Halloween 2018, okay? He was locked up. He didn't look weak at all at that point. He was standing up straight with no signs of being some weathered and fimble old man, okay? He also didn't even have his mask for decades. So how is it now that he only spent like four years, maybe, not killing. We don't even know, actually, what the hell he was doing all those years. We have no clue what he was doing during the time gap. How is it now that all of a sudden he has to kill in order to even just stand or walk? There was nothing building up to this moment. It didn't make sense within the trilogy or even as a Halloween film with Michael Myers. So he ends up killing the guy while Corey holds him steady and he's back to the normal Michael Myers they spent building for 40 years out of nowhere. After that, Corey heads over to Allison, and he starts to have a complete emo rage fit after the events that just transpired with Michael. He's freaking out, and you're not quite sure at this point, like I wasn't at least, if he actually had remorse for what he did, or if he was just trying to use this as a tool to play Allison. Either way, though, completely unfucking necessary. Like, we're now 58 minutes into the movie. We've seen Michael twice, kill once, and he looked like he was ready to croak. What the actual fuck? Like, honestly, like, like, what the fuck? There wasn't, there hasn't even at this point been any real buildup towards the epic showdown of Laurie and Michael. 
despite the fact that it is literally the sole purpose of this movie. Like, it's not to introduce a brand new character into the franchise. This movie was marketed and laid the expectations out that it was going to be focused solely on the showdown between Laurie and Michael. We're now over halfway into the movie, and there's been zero build-up to the epic showdown between Laurie and Michael. There's been no build-up in this movie. And you wonder why fans are pissed, and why some people consider that showdown to be anticlimactic. It's because there was no build-up to it. It just happened. But anyways, we're going to get to that. Now, Michael finally shows up, and we see him outside of Laurie's house while Corey's inside with Allison. He does a signature stalk behind a tree while Laurie's standing outside the house looking in. She sees Allison and Corey going up to their bedroom, and she has a look of fear and concern on her face. The next morning, we see Corey and Allison had ended up spending the night together, and on Allison's nightstand, there's a clown mask hanging up that is the same one Corey had worn the night they went to the Halloween party. He grabs the mask and ends up heading out. At the same time, Lori's at the bar chatting with Lindsay about the events that were unfolding with Corey. Lindsay arranges a conversation between Lori and the father of the boy that Corey had murdered. He talks about how he had seen Corey the day before their conversation, and he looked like he was going down a dark path. This worries Lori even more, and she's not sure what to do. And at the same time, Michael's back in Haddonfield right now, with Corey as his trusty sidekick, killing people so he can get his power back. God damn, I, ne- I, guys, I honestly, I need a minute here. I didn't expect that I would be doing this kind of review for Halloween Ends. Like at the end of the day, I honestly thought I was going to be talking to you guys about a movie that I, we all loved and that had, you know, maybe a couple of flaws that we could laugh at. But no, this was a fucking dumpster fire. Anyways, let's get back to it. So they end up killing a couple rich motherfuckers, and Michael Myers does the uh, Bob kill that he did back in 1978. And I had first seen that they were going to do this kill, they were going to recreate it. I'd first seen it in the trailers, right? And I realized at that point this kill was making a comeback, so I was pumped. It's my favorite kill in the whole Halloween franchise. Like, I was jacked that they were recreating that. I thought it was a good homage. And then when I watched this movie, and we finally reached this kill, it had zero impact for me. For one, I was way too upset at the fact that their portrayal of Michael has been off the rails. Mix in the fact that Michael's teaming up with some random kid? Like, it just doesn't feel right in any way. Moving on, Corey and Allison meet up again. They go on another joyride on his moped. Badass killer on a fucking moped. Ooh, scary. Anyways, they further push the unnecessary relationship between these two throughout the fucking movie. The fact that there was any focus on a relationship between these two, it totally killed the movie for me. Like, Halloween is not a franchise where relationships are wanted nor needed. Like, I know I'm in for the whole, you know, Hawkins and Strode relationship, but that's not a focal point. That's like a side plot that we get to hopefully find out at the end of the movie that they got together and it's a happily ever after, but it's not the fucking plot. Like, this is a slasher franchise, not a romantic drama story about the life of two misfits falling in love. And it's at this point, too, in the story that Allison ends up deciding in the end that she's going to leave Haddonfield forever and fly away on Corey's moped to live happily ever after. Yeah, that's a great fucking ending. Anyways, so the next day's Halloween. Finally, it's October 31st. Corey wakes up in the same house where he had murdered the boy. For some reason, he thought he was going to sleep there, probably because his mom's a fucking bitch. But he ends up waking to the sound of tapping, which is Laurie Strode sitting in a chair casually waiting for him to wake up. This scene, I thought, was actually pretty badass. Jamie Lee Curtis, right, like, she truly carried this movie. And in this scene, she totally killed it. Like, she talks to Corey about how his relationship with Allison is no longer acceptable. And she warns him, leave her alone. She offers him help, but stands firm that he can, you know, no longer be with Allison. This is over. Corey ends up blaming Lori. So a lot of blame on Lori in this movie for a whole bunch of different things. He blames her for being the one who brought him into this to begin with. He then says the line that if he can't have her, no one will. And he's going to stay with Allison. He says that Lori just has to give in and surrender to the feeling that she had when she first saw Michael Myers. Corey, of course, is absolutely enraged at this point at the, the fact that Laurie would even try to take Allison away from him. He decides that he's going to call Allison and tell her that they need to leave Haddonfield tonight because Laurie apparently wants to kill him. So all, Allison's, you know, obviously pretty confused by it all, yet she agrees to meet him anyways because it makes total sense that your grandmother would want to kill your boyfriend, right? Right? 
Anyways, Corey heads back into the sewer, and he finds Michael, and he begins attacking him. Like, Corey begins to fight Michael. You would usually think that's suicide, right? Michael fights back with Corey, of course, but this kid incapacitates Michael Myers and physically removes his mask. You heard me right, and I refuse to say it again. <laughs> like, out of all the people, Laurie Strode included, who went after Michael, this kid can somehow fight him, win, and steal his mask. I call absolute fucking bullshit. And this right here, guys, this was the moment I vowed to bury this movie. They've now taken away, because this is canon, right? Like, this is canon, guys. They've now taken away all credibility from Michael and Laurie, including the final showdown that happens in this movie. Their final showdown no longer means anything. It's like seeing Ric Flair wrestle The Undertaker. Two old people going at it in wheelchairs, basically. Like, not to say that they can't hold their own, but you don't want the final showdown to involve a villain who's weak. Like, not only does it invalidate Michael as a character, it completely invalidates Laurie's struggle and her final showdown with him. Like, the argument now can be, of course, she won, but he was an old guy who could barely walk out of the sewer. Now that his mask has been stolen and he had his ass kicked by some random kid in Haddonfield, who the fuck cares? Like, if Michael appears again in this film, who truly cares? Who's scared? Anyone? No one. Because they'll just look at him and say, pfft, I'll beat you down, old man. Like, it's ridiculous. They did him dirty. And they did him wrong. So, of course, now Corey feels like he's some kind of badass because he has Michael Myers' mask. So he decides he's going to lure the bullies who gave him so much trouble. We then see Allison, she's caught packing up by Lori, who, of course, you know, tries to stop her and reason with her about Corey. She explained everything she found regarding Corey, including his mother, the fact that she saw the darkness inside him, that she saw in Michael, but it doesn't work in the end. We then go back to Corey, who ended up luring those bullies to his dad's garage, and he's lying in wait for them. Each of the bullies begin to be slaughtered by Corey while he's wearing Michael Myers' mask. Some of the kids get help in the form of Corey's dad, who had been hanging out in the back, he finds Corey standing outside, holding Michael Myers' mask, and then he gets accidentally shot by one of the kids. Corey literally, then just out of nowhere, poof, disappears into thin air. Then he reappears to take care of the rest of the bullies with a blowtorch. Like, this is canon, guys. This is now canon. This movie is canon. All right, so Corey, or should I say Michael now, um, he heads home, grabs a kitchen knife, which he then uses to murder his mother, while wearing the Michael Myers mask. Then he continues his murderous rampage going after all the bullies and people who gave him a hard time in Haddonfield. Typical. Lori, at the same time, is trying to get a hold of Allison and convince her, you know, come back home. Allison's heading over to Corey's place at the time, though, but of course doesn't find him because he's out fucking killing everybody in Haddonfield. And then Lori heads upstairs, she dials 911, to report her own suicide. Yeah. And like, no joke, guys, I screamed at my screen during this part because Halloween Ends has been so ridiculous <laughs> up until this point that I honestly thought they were going to have her do it. I honestly thought that, that they were going to have her commit suicide and that was going to be the end of Laurie Strode. And it wouldn't have been out of the realm of possibility considering how left field this film really is. It wasn't out of the realm of possibility. Though fortunately, it was all a ruse, because <laughs> she apparently knew that Corey was in her house dressed as Michael Myers, ready to kill her. So a fight between the two ensues, and the two end up in Lori's front hallway where she tells Corey to kill her. She's unmasked him at this point, and Allison has decided to make her way back home. Corey, he can hear her pulling into the driveway, so he starts maniacally laughing. He takes the knife, plunges it into his neck, just as Allison's walking in the door. And Lori, of course, being the savior that she is, goes and grabs the knife to take it out of Corey's neck just as Allison walks in, so makes it look like that Lori killed him. We're 90 minutes in here. We are 90 minutes into the film. And you feel it's necessary to add a whole new element to the plot and the relationship between two main characters of this trilogy? Out of nowhere. Like, how is that necessary? It's seriously not fucking necessary. So Allison, of course, starts screaming over Corey's body. She's screaming at Lori, gets herself up and leaves the house, blames Lori for all of it, of course. And as Lori's trying to get herself together, she notices that her back door is open. That's because Michael finally showed up. Finally. 
he ended up thankfully killing Corey and effectively taking him out for future installments, so at least that's a good thing. Now that Corey was taken care of, we can finally have this epic showdown that everybody wanted between Laurie and Michael. But honestly, at this point, does it even matter? You know, you've built up a feeble old man to take on a 70-plus-year-old woman. Yeah, this sounds super interesting to me now. 40 years of build-up, and this is what we get. Like, I truly couldn't be excited about this fight. Like, everything before it just negated it and threw it out the fucking window. So we see Michael searching the house for Lori. She hides in a closet, similar to her situation in Halloween 1978. And then Michael starts making his way over to the closet, but Lori's smart. She jumps out and begins attacking Michael. The ensuing fight goes back and forth, with each of them pulling some pretty epic moves on each other. Had this fight scene happened at the end of Halloween Kills, I feel like it would have been the most epic moment in horror movie history. That's just my opinion. There's actually even one point in this fight where Lori pulls out a knitting needle on Michael, and as she goes to stab him with it, he catches it. And I really liked that, because it shows that, well, Michael's learning from Lori's tricks, right? She tried the same thing to him in 1978. Although in the fight, Lori ends up pinning Michael's hands to her kitchen table with kitchen knives, and she begins stabbing Michael in the chest. But of course, Michael keeps getting back up. So she decides to drop a fridge on him to keep him pinned down. Which isn't necessarily the worst idea, right? Like, definitely using your environment, so I can kind of dig it. <laughs> but it's just I never expected them to actually go that length and use a fridge to pin Michael Myers down. So that was creative. Then, and I hated this scene. Now, I won't bash the movie because they went in this direction. But as a Michael fan, it was, it was still a little bit upsetting. It was still a little upsetting. But I'm not going to be the guy that says, oh, Michael died, so this movie's crap. No, that's not what made the movie crap. That's, that's not it. Lori ends up stabbing Michael in the ribs. And then she takes off his mask. And it shows the most that we've ever seen of his face ever on film. It's not the full face. You're getting like a half kind of face look. But it's the most you've ever gotten of Michael Myers' real face. Lori, she says her final goodbyes and then slits his throat. But Michael Myers rises one last time. <laughs> It's like they were they were trying to really hard to play on the trope and like not let us know right away who was going to live and who was going to die, which I, I kind of like that. I did really like that. He ends up reaching out and grabs Lori's throat while she's begging him to kill her. And we see this like epic flashback sequence of their legacy together. And because of that flashback sequence, I was really hoping that both of them would go down together. Like I was just I felt it would be the best way to end it off. You know, I'm not mad that I didn't get the exact ending that I wanted. I just feel that it would have been a really fitting end to have Lori kill Michael and then Michael kills Lori, right? I just, uh, I feel like that would have been a good ending. But anyways, Allison shows up and she ends up saving Lori, breaking Michael's arm in the process. Then they take the knife and also slit Michael's wrists, effectively symbolizing right there that Michael Myers is dead, right? Like they have a fridge pinned on him. <laughs> his his hands are pinned, but with kitchen knives to a table, his throat's been slit, and his wrists have been slit. Pretty sure he's dead. But no! <laughs> they wanted to make a statement with this movie. They couldn't just leave it at that and let horror fans mourn the death of Michael Myers and even maybe possibly theorize how he's still alive. No, they didn't want us to do any of that. They wanted to make a clear statement that Michael Myers is now dead. <laughs> so uh, Hawkins responds to the scene where other officers are there and they find Lori and Allison standing over Michael's dead body. So what do they do? They tie him to the roof of a car and they drive him through town. They take him through a procession of people like he's crowd surfing and put him in a meat grinder that completely decimates his corpse. Like this thing, like there's dirt, there's no coming back from that. Like, his body is is no longer. <laughs> like, they literally crushed his body. Unless, you know, he's going to be Deadpool, he's not coming back. So they made a very, very clear statement with definitively ending the character of Michael Myers. And like I said, Michael being dead is not the problem with this movie. And I want to make that clear. One of them had to die. It just happened to be Michael. <laughs> not to mention, and keep this in mind, guys, how many times have you personally in your life said, when will Michael finally die? And I'm sure at one point you've wanted it to happen. <laughs> but regardless, they, they did do an onerous send-off for Michael Myers. I have to give them credit there. The movie ends off with Allison and Laurie making amends, and we get to see more of the blossoming relationship between Hawkins and Laurie. It finally comes to fruition. And the final scene of the movie 
because they, they didn't make enough of a statement <laughs> with what they did to Michael. The final scene of the movie shows the shots of Laurie's home, similar to the final shots of Halloween 1978, though instead of hearing Michael's breathing, the sounds of birds are chirping, and then Don't Fear the Reaper by Blue Oyster Cult brings in the end credits. And that's Halloween Ends, guys. That is Halloween Ends and it is in its entirety right there. And in all honesty, I would have been okay with this as the first movie of the trilogy. Because it's obvious that the tone of this movie was the impact that evil has on people in society. That's a great concept. And it was, at the end of the day, executed correctly. It was. Though it was not appropriate as the third entry of a trilogy. Too many new themes were introduced. There was too many new characters we didn't need. They didn't need to be featured. And they didn't need to have extended character arcs and development. Like, if they were to have given us this as the first movie of the franchise, no doubt horror fans would still be pissed. Like, there's no, there's no way around that. If you were to release this movie at any point, past, present, future, everyone, horror fans would have been pissed. But they wouldn't have been as pissed, right? We would have been able to understand that the franchise was moving in a different direction. And we would have had time to accept that and actually make a logical decision on whether or not we're going to like this new direction, right? We may even possibly fucking enjoy it. Like, <laughs> who knows? But the fact is that we had two slasher films in this trilogy that ended with a dramatic film. Halloween Ends is a drama posing as a slasher film. And I understand there's a lot of divide right now in the horror community over this. I I know, I see it. Trust me. And I truly understand both sides of the argument. Though you can't blame people for being upset about this movie. The expectation was to see Michael Myers slash his way through Haddonfield and have a final showdown with Laurie Strode. That's even how it was marketed. But instead, we got the Corey Cunningham show with special cameo appearances from Michael Myers. And that is a fact. That's the biggest gripe I feel people have with this movie. It's not even the amount of screen time that Michael had. No, it's, it has nothing to do with that. It's the lack of buildup through this movie and the fact they spent 40 years building up a character only to diminish his legacy when all was said and done. I hope you guys really enjoyed this four-part review on the Halloween series. I had an absolute blast doing this. We went over every single movie that I absolutely adore and love and hate. (laughs) It's been a great time, and thank you everyone who's taken the time to listen. I super appreciate it, and there's going to be a hell of a lot more podcasts coming out every single Tuesday. You can listen to the Cabin of Horrors podcast wherever you find podcasts. Next week, we are going to be doing a replay Play, but with a, with a little bit of a twist. So next week, I'm going to be releasing the entire franchise review of Evil Dead. And it's going to contain the episodes Evil Dead 1 and Evil Dead 2 that you can catch from earlier episodes. But I don't know if earlier listeners of the podcast remember this. There was an Army of Darkness episode that was released. It was released after Evil Dead 1 and Evil Dead 2. But somehow, between I was switching podcast platforms, and I didn't notice this, that episode disappeared. It just vanished. It was the only one. It was lost to the Necronomicon. So I'm going to be re-releasing that episode along with the other two Evil Dead episodes to give a full franchise review on Halloween. So make sure you tuned in if you haven't yet already. And I will warn you, it's an earlier episode of the podcast, so please be nice and patient with me. (laughs) I'm just getting my groove of the podcast, but I hope you enjoy all the future episodes coming out. We're going to talk about some pretty cool horror movies in the next couple of months. December, we'll probably talk about some Christmas movies and stuff, right? With the holiday coming in. But there's one franchise that I really, really want to talk about. It's hot right now. It's definitely a hot franchise. And I'm thinking I'm going to, because there's somebody that I want to bring to this podcast. There's, there's a new slasher character that I really want to talk about. You know who that is? Art the Clown. I really want to talk about Terrifier 1 and 2, so I think we should. Stay tuned, and I'll see you in the shadows.